Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. This is Joe Moore. We today talk to James Casey, uh, Army vet, MDMA, PTSD uh, treatment recipient through MAPS Phase 2 studies, a neuroscience and molecular biology student at CU Boulder, co-founder of the uh, Psychedelic Club over at CU Boulder. And yeah, he's got a lot going on, a lot of interesting perspectives, very active guy in the psychedelic world online. And he's actually even doing some really interesting stuff in the lab at CU Boulder. And we get into that during the show. So I think you're going to like this show. Let us know what you think. Hit us up at psychedelics today, email at gmail.com. Quick shout out to our new sponsor, Bluebird Botanicals, great CBD products. And you should really check them out. I've been using it for a while. I really like it. Really thankful to have them on board. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll get back at you in another week. Bye-bye. Hey, everybody. Joe here. Thanks for listening to this episode. We are sponsored now by TransZen, a product uh, from EntheaZen. Caitlin Thompson, who's a member of the psychedelic community, runs events in San Diego, developed this pretty much for herself. And... She uses it every day. I I now use it every day. I think Kyle as well. It's a really cool product that fills in our, a lot of our nutritional gaps. A lot of our behavior and moods come from uh, your diet, your gut biome, and a lot of other factors. But something we can easily control is our nutrition. And this supplement fills out a lot of uh, vitamin, mineral, and amino acids that can really contribute to a uh, feeling better. Uh, It includes dopamine precursors, serotonin precursors, uh, a lot of B vitamins at, you know, reasonable doses, not anything crazy. It's not like you're going overboard. Yeah, it's just a really nice product. I've found that it's really lowered my day-to-day stress. So like the peak stress I would experience with my day job, it's uh, substantially lower now. Using it as a recovery aid after partying, that is for sure a great use case as well. Uh, she used to make a product called, or she's still making it and selling it, but called Weekend Warrior. And TransZen is effectively Weekend Warrior 2. And it's not just for partying anymore. It's for day-to-day stuff. And it's great for us in the psychedelic community. A lot of us are using psychedelics to feel better. And if we don't use them regularly enough, sometimes you feel cranky. Perhaps that's because of gut biome stuff or nutritional deficiencies and some really niche areas like B6, and I uh, wholeheartedly endorse it. That's why I've decided to uh, work with Caitlin as a sponsor and really excited to see where this goes. So check it out, TransZen from EntheoZen, EntheoZen.com, E-N-T-H-E-O-Zen.com. Go to EntheoZen.com slash PT, and you can get a special deal of free shipping. Check it out. Let us know what you think. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Psychedelics Today. Today on the show, we have James Casey. James, thanks for joining. Thank you for having me. Really happy to have you here. So, James, you are a student at Colorado CU Boulder, Colorado University Boulder, and you're studying molecular development, cellular biology, and neuroscience. You're a veteran of the U.S. Army and a MAPS Phase Two MDMA trials participant. So, a lot to talk to you about. Because it sounds like you're on your way to being a psychedelic scientist in your own right. So <laughs> I'd like to be. <laughs> yeah. Well, what we know is that there's tons of work left to do <laughs> because of the blockade against research. There's mm-hmm. still so much, like, uh, for instance, like mushroom chemistry. And uh, th- that one article we posted yesterday that was years old about phenethylamines being found in mushrooms. I thought that was interesting, but it was just, you know, a super old uh, paper when it was published. I was like, oh, whoops, <laughs> thought this was new. Sorry, everybody. But yeah, there's tons of stuff like that. We just don't know the chemistry and interaction on a lot of this stuff. And I think I read something the other day, like we don't even know the mechanism of action for like nitrous oxide. And that stuff's been around for a real long time. Um, well, I've learned a bit about that in my neuroscience classes. It seems like we generally kind of know, but I mean, I could be wrong. We've just been learning, learning kind of abstract things. Okay. Yeah. I remember like, like they were calling it some sort of agonist and I'm like, okay, that, that sounds okay. But like a lot of folks were nervous about like uh, cell death, cellular death. It seems to be like far less a problem than people thought. 
which is interesting. Um, but yeah, there, there's plenty of this stuff left to do, and and obviously education around it too. Because if I'm saying stuff that might not be right, then people that aren't <laughs> actively trying to learn everything they can are also getting things wrong. So let's talk a little bit about what you're studying right now. Like the other, I think like three days ago, I saw that you were doing some extractions on morning glory seeds or something to do to get LSA for like animal or insect tests or something. Yes. So I'm in uh, this lab techniques and neuroscience class. So the first part of the class, we are designing this, the entire lab is designing this experiment and we'll be giving the stimulus to cockroaches over a course of five days and monitor, monitor, monitoring mRNA expression for these cockroaches. So each group, there's four groups in this lab, uh, ended up coming up with a stimulus and the whole lab voted on which one they wanted to do. So the first one was exposing them to a strobe light for five days. Another one was changing temperature for five days. One after that was giving them either like sugar, or nicotine. Uh, all those are cool and all, but I, uh, you know, like you don't have to talk to me that long before I start talking about drugs. I was looking up just different things about cockroaches and I ended up finding out that they have serotonergic receptors on their antenna and salivary glands. And what attaches the serotonin receptors? Psychedelics do. Yep. So DMT uh, is known to attach to like, uh, serotonin receptors, more specifically 5-HT2A, which is, as most people listening to this know, one of the most powerful psychedelics on the planet, you know, according to like subjective human experience. But that's a schedule one substance. We can't really test that at all. But what about DMT is illegal? It's molecular structure. So analogs don't really fall under that. I guess they do under like the Federal Analog Act, but as far as I know, no one's ever been prosecuted under that. And as long as you're doing research on animals or like cell lines or whatever, it's legal and okay. So I was wondering to do dipropyl tryptamine because it also has like a similar magnitude of uh, of an intense experience as DMT. But my the person that runs the lab was afraid she she's still under the impression that it's scheduled or regulated when it's really not. And like, I understand her fear because she has a lot more to lose than I do. But so the, the backup plan was LSA, which is an analog of LSD. But yeah, we ended up extracting that from morning glory seeds. So we ended up putting that into the water supply and they're going to be ingesting that over five days. And what mRNA expression we're looking for is this for this gene called period one and it helps regulate circadian rhythms so we're just seeing if the lsa uh, has a significant effect on that period one gene expression sounds really cool so lsa is in um i guess scheduled under scheduled one uh no it's not hmm. so it's uh it's legal as well as far as i know and uh the extraction seemed pretty easy we just Grounded up about one and a half grams of those seeds, let them sit in some distilled water for about six hours, and then use va vacuum filtration just to get out all the seeds and like foreign bodies from the solution. So we don't really know the concentration of it, which is a little unfortunate. And that's why I was also preferring the DPT because then you know the concentration, but also with these morning glory seeds. God knows what else we're extracting from those. That's into the solution as well. Right. So, you know, whatever influence in gene expression we see might not, I don't think you'd be able to conclusively say it was due to the LSA, which is another problem. Right. Yeah. And from when I used to research this stuff back in the day in like my early 20s, when I was like getting into all this stuff, I remember like morning glory seeds, you'd have to have a significant mount more versus like hawaiian baby wood rose and then there's the mexican cousin i always screw up on the name but it starts with an o and they're kind of like a middle you maybe like 20 25 seeds um versus like morning glories i think it has a, a lower concentration of lsa in it right and hopefully that might hopefully that's not gonna be too big of an issue considering you know humans typically weigh a lot more mm -hmm. whereas cockroaches are yeah pretty, pretty small, small. What's your, what's your hypothesis for this? Do you think, um, like, what type of effect is it going to have? Are you guys just trying to see the gene expression, how that changes? 
So I still need to learn a bit more about this period one gene. As far as I know, and I could be mixing a few of these things up, but generally period one, uh, that gene has to be expressed for light to have an effect on the circadian rhythm in cockroaches. And it's usually due to locomotor activity. So since, I mean, LSD has stimulant-like effects, I would assume LSA would have like similar effects to that, even though a few papers I've read have talked about how LSA produces more vegetative-like effects rather than psychedelic effects. But I would imagine it would it would increase that gene expression. To, there might be a little bit more sensitive to light or something like that. Just since it has stimulant like effects, mm-hmm. I, might, I would assume it might just increase that expression, but I could have that mixed up. And do they have a sleep cycle? So, like, you could monitor them for, like, when they're sleeping? Um, so we're kind of stuck between the rock and a hard place just because this is a class and, and we can only end up doing the dissections of these cockroaches at a specific time during the day. Right. So we're doing it during the light cycle, but the cockroaches are, are in the dark for about 12 hours and in light for about 12 hours, but they prefer darkness. Okay. That's when they're like active. I like that a lot. The fact that CU Boulder is letting you do that is super cool. And <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm really thankful to be able to do. I mean, that's the only that's the only way I'd have been interested in working with cockroaches because those things freak me out. Okay, I'm afraid of insects to begin with, but a cockroach, I'm like a 1950s housewife that jumps on top of a kitchen table after she sees a mouse in the <laughs> mouse or something. But uh, yeah, and then a couple of years ago, I was able to do some other psychedelic research. Have you ever heard of the Ames test at all? Mm-hmm. So okay, it's been a while since I've explained this, but so the, the Ames test. You take this mutant form of salmonella, and they can't really grow because they have this gene knocked out to where they can't produce essential amino acids to survive. So if you introduce carcinogenic or mutagenic substances, it will mutate to that salmonella and pretty much turn on that gene expression, and then they'll be able to create those amino acids that are essential for them to survive. So if you see these colonies forming on the plate, then that could be an indication that's a carcinogenic or mutagenic substance. So I was able to end up giving uh, these mutant, form, mutant cell lines of salmonella. I gave them allylescaline, which is an analog of mescaline, and 4-ACODMT, which is an analog of psilocybin. And none of them seem to be mutagenic or carcinogenic. So that was cool as well. So, so fascinating. I wish I knew more about like... Um... I wish I studied more biology and chemistry just to to know more of this stuff. I just came across somebody in the psychedelic community just posted this article. This might be a little off topic, but about a virus might be triggering like the reason why like humans have consciousness and just talking about how this virus might have like changed some genes way, way back. Just fascinating stuff that, that's even possible or could be possible. Right. Well, it's thought, you know, we don't, we have like we don't use like ninety eight percent of our genetic code anyways. You know, a lot of that's you know termed junk DNA, even mm. though it's shown to have different functions. But a lot of that's thought to be you know viruses that you know humans have encountered. You know, ever since we've been around, really. Interesting. Yeah. Thinking about junk stuff, I think about um, I think Dennis McKenna used to call like secondary compounds and plants like waste materials. But I mean, in some of those, it's like DMT is one of those secondary compounds and right. just junk, but has some crazy effects on humans. And Well, science does tend to make fun of things that it doesn't know, right? Like waste right. materials or junk DNA, even though it's not junk and they're not wasted <laughs> materials. It's probably there for a reason. Just don't really know right. what it is. <laughs> Cool. And how much longer do you have left to see you, Boulder? Uh, I got about a year left for my undergrad degree. Nice. So, Are you trying to stick yeah. it out at CU Boulder for a grad degree? Um, you know, the grad school thing is kind of a recent development. I was going to try to go to med school, but uh, I figure I can accomplish what I want to accomplish just going to grad school, and that would be easier. But, you know, it really just depends what kind of job opportunities I get once I get out of here. You know, like I really don't care too much about leading research as long as I'm in some fulfilling psychedelic research. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd love to be like a lab assistant or research assistant. And, you know, a lot of the, these pioneers in psychedelic research, uh, a lot of the ones that have read their books, seen their talks at psychedelic science and stuff, or 
aren't getting any younger, right? So yeah. by the time I'm done with, you know, med school or grad school, they could be retired um, or passed on or something. So I wouldn't mind just working with my undergrad degree to learn from the lips of the masters, mm-hmm. so to say, and help them with their research. Yeah, that kind of hit me today. Michael Harner, I don't know if you guys are familiar with his work. He was like one of the guys who brought shamanism to the West, who brought like drumming and, and stuff like this. But he just passed. And I was just thinking about like, you know, some of these psychedelic elders in the community getting older. And yeah, what are our roles and how are we going to step into that? Yeah, what are you thinking about like um, career wise, maybe after grad school? Or what would be your ideal like uh, job in the psychedelic community if it's available? Well, I'd love to just research them in general. I'm a, I'm a Puritan when it comes to science. Okay. Like, I believe, like, I don't even believe psychology and stuff is science. That's not an insult, right? Psychology still has it's a, a soft, lot of value. soft science, right? A lot of things that we can learn from, right? But science is supposed to be empirical and objective, repeatable. Like, you're supposed to be able to repeat experiments and get the same result, right? And, you know, psychology is the study of the mind, which is inherently subjective, so it can never be objective. But, but the psychedelic experience is very subjective. So I'd like to learn more about the neurological mechanisms that kind of create the psychedelic experience and try to go as close to the subjective as possible while still remaining objective. That's interesting. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I'd be interested, interested in working with pretty much any of the classical psychedelics. Uh, like I said, we already like kind of understand the neurological pathways that they take in the brain, but we don't really understand a lot of what gives us that experience, you know, what makes the walls melt or makes us see faces and everything. I mean, we kind of got a general idea with uh, David Nett's research over at the Imperial College of London when they did the fMRI studies or brain scans on people that took some LSD, Mm -hmm. but uh, there's still a long way to go. I'm just kind of curious why people aren't going international to places with softer laws like Portugal or like, you know, Jamaica or Brazil or Peru to do more research with this stuff. Is it funding? Uh, you know, I'm not sure if it's just the funding or the absurd amount of red tape that you have to cut through to end up doing research like this. I mean, phase two for the NDMA studies, like just wrapped up, but Rick Doblin has been working on this since the creation of maps in like 1985 or 86 or something like that. So it's taken a lot of years and just to get approved for these studies, you know, you got to get the FDA to sign off on it, DA to sign off on it, all these national agencies, local agencies, like state and County kind of stuff. So it's just a lot of red tape that you got to cut through. And I'm not sure like with the other classical psychedelics, but you know, with MDMA in general, the patent on it has expired, so there's no money in it for pharmaceutical companies, which, you know, it makes sense why they wouldn't pursue that uh, because then they're just wasting, like, millions of dollars. Right. But it makes it difficult because, like, it's kind of falling back on private funding or nonprofit organizations to kind of fill that void. Right. I mean, looking at, like, Imperial, they're doing some, like, fantastic work. They're doing DMT research right now, and they were able to do LSD research, psilocybin, MDMA research, all under, like, the neuroscience. But, um, you know, I think that's pretty pretty fascinating because here in the States, I can't, I mean, besides Strassman's work, hasn't been too much DMT research and not too much, like, fMRI, like, neuroscience stuff coming out of the States. I think there is some stuff with, like, MDMA that they're kind of teaming up with the maps to do some of that stuff. Yeah, well, it's going to be, it's, it's, I mean, we don't know too much because after, you know, these things were scheduled in the 70s, psychedelic research kind of just stopped. And now FDA and DA is becoming more open to signing off on these studies. So it's going to be a new field. And there's, like, tons of potential for, like, all these different uh, disciplines of research. So I'm excited for it. I think it'll become easier as, as the years go by to <clears throat> end up doing this research in the States. Yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like the the red tape is partly funding and partly getting universities to approve certain studies. A lot of people want to do it under the auspices of a university for whatever reason. I don't understand the research world. So like, my buy like I, I'm a, I live in software, so I'm like I don't know. You just do it. Like, so what? <laughs> like, like, yeah. like find some guy or just like I don't know. Save up three grand and go to Peru and do some do some sessions. It's, you know, it's just paperwork, and you know maybe you want to do some lab work and blood and whatever. But you know you could at least do something. It sounds like people are doing that a little bit, but it just seems slow. Like 
McKenna, I think it was early early 2000s or late 90s, did some stuff. I, it might have even been with Strassman or Grobe, but down in, in Brazil looking at those um, ayahuasca use populations. So it's happening, but it's, I don't know. I think I'm just frustrated. I'm like, <laughs> there's so many things to study. Some of it is kind of cheap. So like, I don't know, maybe it's a lack of creativity. Maybe it's just, you know, if you're in a university setting, you don't want to risk your standing. You'll never get right, tenure. There's a lot of fear surrounding it. Mm. Yeah. If you do X, you'll never get tenure. And it's like, I think that's kind of a BS mm. thing. <laughs> like being fearful because of them holding something over you. It's kind of like, oh, didn't you go to school to like not be held hostage? Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. That's probably just me. Cool. So what, uh, where should we go from here? Anything? Um... I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there is, you had some pretty active involvement with the Boulder, the Psychedelic Club of Boulder. I for, They're very uh, deliberate with their fra- the order of the words. I've been corrected 300 times. <laughs> so like Denver Psychedelic Club, Psychedelic Club. I don't know. Uh, is it Psychedelic Club of Boulder? Sure. You know, I think <laughs> I, we, we would always just refer to ourselves as the Psychedelic Club, maybe SCU Boulder or something. Um, SCU Boulder, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I never really paid attention to how I would tell people about it. I just said it was a psychedelic club. <laughs> so. You know, that's nice. And were you uh, part of the leadership there? Yes, I was. So me and Nick Morris founded the psychedelic club yeah. in 2014, just because, you know, there <clears throat> at that time there wasn't really any, I mean, it, let me put it this way. Like once I got to Boulder, I was looking for a psychedelic like club because I thought if anywhere in the country, if there was a psychedelic club, it'd be at CU Boulder. <laughs> and I was really surprised that there wasn't. So I ended up going to the first one that Nick Moore started. And it was kind of funny. It was like the first meeting was like 10 of us sitting in this circle. And we just kind of like introduced ourselves and stuff. And and right afterwards, I – oh, yeah. So we so at the beginning of the meeting, Nick said, okay, everyone, just say your first name. And is there anything else that uh, we should introduce ourselves with? And this girl goes, oh, yeah, and your spirit animal. <laughs> and, you know, Was she serious? I'm from Louisiana, North Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm from Louisiana, North Carolina, typically very conservative places. Um, I used to be in the military, right? So that's pretty conservative as well. So when I ended up hearing the spirit animal thing, it just made me cringe. And I ended up talk, talking to Nick immediately after that meeting. Like, listen, dude, I, uh, I'm credible. I know what the real world's like, what people want to listen to, what they don't want to listen to. I just really need to get involved in this. And we did. And we started to get all these emails from these people across the country that were interested in starting their own psychedelic club. And it was just something that quickly became bigger than ourselves. Yeah. Let's let's dig into that a little bit because I mean we have a little like PDF on how to start your club and you know I think it's always interesting we we always ask a lot of our guests on like how do you get involved or how do you get things going and it's always really awesome to hear different perspectives so what was that process like to start this club at the university? Um, it wasn't really that difficult. We just ended up signing a few like a little bit of paperwork with the university just to establish ourselves as a club. And then we had to go to a few different hearings to get some funding and stuff. But that changes a lot throughout different universities Mm -hmm. and places in more conservative areas uh, like North Dakota and Georgia. There's chapters of Psychedelic Club that have opened up there. And they encountered a lot more resistance than we did. So it's different really for each one. But as long as, you know, you're remaining professional about it as long as you're not telling people to break the law and take a substance you really have nothing to worry about so once we started the club we tried to make ourselves as credible as possible by working with maps by you know doing things for the community that would say that that kind of just showed that we're not just a drug club we're not a bunch of people that come to meetings to try to find drugs or to just talk about our spirit animals and stuff which is fine you can do that if you want to right but you know that's not exclusively what it was about and what's great is that each chapter can end up focusing on whatever that particular community or not the psychedelic community but the community surrounding the psychedelic community like in those areas they know what uh, the public out there will be receptive to and listen to. And that's different for each location. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
yeah, we did some great things for a while. We were renting out uh, the dance ca- dance safe uh, test kits to students over around CU Boulder, just so they could identify this, their substances. And that was really helpful because we ended up getting some statistics when we first did it. About 40% of the LSD that was tested wasn't actually LSD. It was a very, wow. like various research chemicals. 88% of the MDMA that was tested was actually meth. Wow. So, you know, I think you were getting 88%. MDMA nine times out of 10. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> nine times out of 10, you're getting meth. And so how'd you, really, get, how'd you okay. get the feedback or those statistics as you ask people to kind of report back on what they were testing? Or did you do the testing right there and report it? No. So we don't want people to end up bringing Schedule One substances on campus so that makes sense <laughs> yeah so we would just end up giving them the test kit they give us like 20 i think a 20 dollar collateral or something like that you test your substances at home uh bring the test kit back a day later and let us know the results what they thought they had and what the results were or how many yeah how many students do you think did this um what were the numbers like well we did this over the course of about a year and a half so i don't know i don't really remember maybe like 50 or 50 to 100. I mean, it wasn't okay. a large sample size. Yeah. Hmm. But there was enough to like try to scare the students into being responsible, you know, and not just take whatever they were told that they got from a drug dealer. Right. But that's about after like a year and a half, uh, after we started to get some press coverage for that and it was starting to be recognized, university's legal team ended up coming across it. Uh, apparently, drug testing kits are considered drug paraphernalia so they ended up nixing that so we couldn't do that anymore unfortunately wow even though you can buy test kits at walmart which is or not walmart at walgreens which Mm -hmm. is kind of weird but yeah well that's awesome that you guys even were raising awareness i mean that's a pretty surprising number 88 percent of the mtma was meth that's yeah pretty frightening well you know though meth is fairly harmless unless you're using it at massive doses and smoking it I don't know too many people smoking um, MDMA. Thank goodness. If, uh... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, you're, you're right. It's kind of creepy. Like I, I guarantee probably more than 50% of my drug using friends have done meth then. It's pretty intense. <laughs> right. uh, in fact, perhaps I have too, unknowingly. <laughs> <laughs> um, you never know how the night goes. But uh, yeah, right. now, now with test kits, like it's pretty easy to test for the presence of things and you know, does it in fact test positive for indoles or whatever? I I really like these new fentanyl test strips. Have you ever um, tried those guys out? I, uh, I have not. Yeah. I've like heard about them in passing, but I don't know too terribly much about. Yeah, we talked to Mitch Gomez, so. the director, executive director of Dance Safe, and he was saying you have to um, kind of dissolve the drug into some sort of liquid solution, maybe vodka or something, and just evaporate it off. And then uh, while it's in a liquid form, it can test for the presence of fentanyl uh, or carfentanyl at very small doses. Like, uh, man, I wish I remembered the numbers. It was like, you know, just extraordinary to the point where it would be like maybe overkill in some cases. (laughs) So if it ever, like a kilogram of cocaine, for instance, ever touched like a little bit of fentanyl, it would probably test positive, you know, something like that. Um, Right. Well, that's, that's good to know because I, uh, yeah, I was kind of confused how they'd end up testing for something like that just because, you know, if you have a brick of heroin, the, f- the fentanyl is, you know, active in extremely small doses. So whatever piece of that brick you're cutting off and testing might not actually contain the fentanyl. So it might not test positive. But if you're dissolving it, then mm-hmm. that makes sense. Yeah, dissolve and mix. And, you know, it's pretty cheap. I looked at them the other day. It was like, uh, I think, 20 bucks for a 10-pack of strips or something along those lines. Um, so obviously a lot cheaper than an ambulance ride or cheaper than a funeral. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, on one hand, I feel like our culture is overreacting quite a bit on the opiate front, you know, obviously being on the side of the drug war I'm on, like, that's how I feel. But you know, I, people need opiates. We need, we need drugs to take care of ourselves. Still. We don't want people to go with pain. We still need to do research to find new drugs that are less addictive, perhaps. And well, um, what do you mean overreacting? Just like pretty much just saying opiates are bad. Hey, everybody. Joe here. This podcast is brought to you by Anthea Zen. We want to feature their product, TransZen. It is great. And I've been taking it daily for a while now. I think it's a wonderful product. And we want to 
have more of you guys try it out. We've partnered with them to get you free shipping. So check them out at amphiazen.com slash PT to get your Psychedelics Today free shipping offer. Doctors are under orders. Like, uh, I think doctors are getting pressured or in a lot of ways, they're not allowed to prescribe the same way they have been. Um, I think there's stricter rules Mm -hmm. and there's less prescriptions for opiates going out. You know, in some cases, that's good. But if somebody has chronic pain and we're refusing to treat them with drugs that we have available, then that's, I think, subpar uh, from a healthcare perspective. Um, Right. I know it's a dangerous tool, but it's a tool we have in our toolkit, and, and we should use it the right way. I think maybe doctors are just not sure what the right way is, and they're getting pressure as a result. Yeah, here in New Jersey, it's really tough. I know um, some folks that have chronic pain, and, and they have an impossible time trying to get pain uh, medication, because mm-hmm. um, Chrissy was super hard on it here. Yeah, and it's kind of like a BS argument in a lot of ways. Like a lot of politicians are just like, oh, well, let's be hard on drugs. And all they do is increase sentencing, like spending, like uh, let's give cops more military grade weapons. <laughs> it's like, come on, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> come on. Is that really yeah. it? But at the same time, I, I do know a lot of people that have died around here. It's a big problem. So it's, yeah, it's a double edged sword, you know? Right. And I understand, like, you know, even though it's, it's wrong. I understand where a lot of those people are coming from. Like, you know, my brother, he, one of my older brothers, he's a cop over in Alabama and, you know, he's one of the most anti-police police officers I've ever <laughs> met, but you know, they deal with a lot of like crack, you know, meth and just these brutal murders of, of these people that, you know, either can't pay or that are like cheating other people and stuff. So if you're like dealing with, you know, a lot of innocent people in a sense being murdered, Uh, I can see, like, why someone would want to kind of, like, militarize the police and just throw away these, you know, drug dealers and drug users, even though I think ultimately that's, like, not level-headed, you know, it's not logical. I understand why they might feel that way. Yeah, I totally get the sentiment, right? And it's it comes down to education and, like, not understanding the history, like, prohibition of alcohol and the federal government poisoning booze to kill people. Like, that's ridiculous. And it's kind of still happening in a lot of ways. and. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but I, yeah, totally, totally. I, I just watched a, a bunch of television documentaries, quote unquote, about the drug war. And it's been very intense watching like, uh, the way people react to, to smugglers and dealers and the, the fact that, um, heroin dealers are getting murder sentences. Unbelievable to me, but you know, this, wow. we're going down a not so psychedelic path perhaps. <laughs> but you it's know it relates related, I guess. yeah it's kind of related because psychedelic users and psychedelic drug dealers get similar if not stiffer sentences than than for heroin trafficking or cocaine half trafficking i know cocaine's pretty pretty safe for the most part if you're if you're doing your drug testing but you know still complications there and risks and but yeah the fact that the sentencing for lsd is so intense i think is just crazy and something we'd have to be really careful about and that's why i kind of like try to lump them all in together because you're not Mm going to necessarily you know it's a pretty small set of the population that does psychedelics so you're going to have to talk about everything um right in general that's why I think it's good to kind of like lump them together anyways, at least schedule one substances because, you know, if you're working to end up legalizing or making the public accept that LSD shouldn't be a schedule one substance, that's great. But that's a lot of work and effort for one compound. And then you would have to move on to like mescaline or DMT or psilocybin. And like at that point, it just makes more sense to just encompass all drugs and just kind of talk about how we need to research kind of all these things, test these things and, you know, like, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but, like, how, <laughs> like, every, like, nothing is inherently bad. There's no such thing as, like, illegal drugs or bad drugs. It's just how you use them, really. That's What's that old saying? It's like uh, medicine, or poison can be medicine, but medicine can be poison. Right. It's just, it's just how we use it. Yeah. And that's why I don't understand the whole argument with uh, the states that are, or, you know, I've met a lot of people that are, like, in terms of cannabis, you know, I'm for medicinal use of cannabis, but not for recreational use. But the only just doesn't make much sense to me because the only person that can determine if something is a medicine is the user, right? So, mm-hmm. I mean, like, if someone's like taking cannabis because it helps them relax, then like that's medicinal for them, even though someone else might consider that 
recreational. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've had some really difficult conversations with physicians on this stuff and I, I cannot believe like the level of self-certainty and like cynicism they have around medical cannabis. And it's like, come on guys, <laughs> alcohol is legal. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Like, can you really have this position? Unbelievable to me, but yeah, that's why we live. Two of the three of us here live in Colorado and maybe the third will move here eventually. We'll see. So, um, <laughs> so the whole concept of the federal government being able to like say you can and cannot do things or state governments having the same opinion. It's just crazy to me. Have you, have you been exposed much to the cognitive Liberty movement people? I've watched a few talks on it and that I think is the best argument for legalization of just all drugs in general. The psychedelics have kind of led me to the whole cognitive Liberty aspect of it. It's just like everything that we put in our bodies, we eat or drink, drink you know affects the way we think right so the coffee we drink in the morning the beer we drink after like a long days of work the joint someone smokes in their backyard the acid some hippie chick takes at a music festival or the heroin some junkie shoots up in his raggedy ass apartment all affects the way we think right so like my question is is do you have the right to think how you want to think or do you have to seek permission from the state in order to have the thoughts that you want to have and if you don't have that freedom of thought, then you don't have freedom of speech. And that's a First Amendment issue that we all need to be concerned with, whether you use drugs or not. That leads me personally into guns. <laughs> I've been hunting for a while now. And um, I know Joe Rogan does drugs. He has guns. I guess technically uh, quite illegal on the federal level to be a... I, <laughs> when I look at the forms you sign, a drug user, illegal drug user, and a gun owner. And if... From what I understand, if you're found with drugs and guns in your home, it's a really big fine or sentence. Like, uh, I think even if you have a couple joints and and like a 22 rifle, they could put you in jail for a couple of days or something. Do you know much about this stuff? Yeah, kind of. Like, so I got a concealed and carry permit, so I usually carry a handgun on me at all times. Since I have that, I can't get a medical marijuana card because it contradicts federal law. Hmm. So, yeah, that's unfortunate, which really stinks for a lot of people that do have these, you know, medical marijuana cards. They can't defend themselves if need be or go hunting, you know, like huh. you were just talking about. Yeah. Or you got to pay double for the retail price for, for cannabis. You right. don't get those tax right. breaks. I think that's the biggest thing with medical cannabis is you get a huge tax break, at least in Colorado. Um, the mm -hmm. pricing is extraordinarily better i can't speak to the quality of products i think every shop and facility is different in a lot of ways but that's that's a big deal yeah and you guys actually did a really interesting thing with the psychedelic club of boulder with <laughs> you're like shooting at chemicals is that right <laughs> yeah so uh you know that's actually one of my favorite events that we did with the psychedelic club is um so yeah we went to the shooting range and had an actual war on drugs <laughs> and we had three lanes set up the first one we had a bunch of handguns like you know some nine mils 45s 40s and we ended up having these uh, bullseye targets and we filled up uh, some balloons with paint and put them on the target so people would shoot the targets and they would splatter these like neon colors of paint so you could create your own like psychedelic artwork that's cool at the range yeah, and then the other one, we had a bunch of hunting rifles. So we had like a 30 out 6, 308, and then an old school Moss and the Gop, which is like a World War One, World War Two Russian sniper rifle. And we set up some human silhouette targets to kind of like reinforce the idea that it's not a war on drugs, it's war on people. And then finally, we had some uh, AR 15s and a couple AK 47s. Wow. And we and we uh, ended up filling up some Ziploc bags full of flour that was supposed to be cocaine. We had some bags full of uh, portable mushrooms, which were supposed <laughs> to be psilocybin mushrooms. And then we had some actual cannabis. We had some uh, cannabis trimmings that we just ended up shooting. So, and it was great because we got to talk to a lot of other people, you know, at the ranges, and a lot of people that are going to the shooting range aren't really exposed to drugs a lot you know typically very conservative people a lot of people out there with their kids you know teaching them how to shoot and stuff so we got to have some really great conversations with people that normally would never be exposed to psychedelics or we don't really talk in great detail about the war on drugs and how it's really affecting everybody that's awesome <laughs> cool way to start a conversation <laughs> yeah so i'm kind of curious like 
maybe a little bit about your background. How'd you get involved or what, what sparked your interest to um, get involved in psychedelics or what, what piqued your interest in psychedelics? Well, I was, well, I'd say the D.A.R.E. program. Middle school <laughs> did. Uh, I remember just like learning about, you know, all these different drugs and then ended up going on to LSD and they talked about how, you know, some people think they can fly and jump off buildings or think they're a fish and drown in a pool. And then they were, when they were talking about the effects, like, yeah, and some people uh, talk about how they can hear colors and see sounds. And it's like, wow, that sounds, uh, sounds fascinating. I want to do that. So I was always kind of interested in it. And I experimented a little bit in high school, but I kind of forgot about it, about that once I joined the military. Uh, I ended up going to basic like two weeks after I graduated high school. And pretty much when I was done with my training, I went straight to Afghanistan and did a full uh, 12-month tour, came back. I was still 19 years old. I was suffering, you know, from uh, PTSD, and I was lucky enough to get in that MDMA-assisted psychotherapy uh, study. Mm-hmm. And I just kind of opened my eyes to the to the healing potential of these things, because up until that point, I was pretty unaware, you know, the, the, the therapeutic use of, you know, psychedelic medicines. I was just kind of using them for fun or to explore my mind in my younger years. And uh, I just started to see the injustice in it all and the need for research and all the potential. And I've never looked back since. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. And how did you come across the research? Was just like looking the paper or you went on maps? So <laughs> when I was in the Army, I was still in San Antonio at the time. I knew when I got out, I was going to come to Boulder, uh, go to school over at CEU. So like I said before, you know, Louisiana, North Carolina, military is all very conservative. Boulder, not very conservative. <laughs> so uh, I was trying to like figure out a way to relate to people when I ended up moving here. So I went to the hippie new age section over in Barnes and Noble and just started looking at different books and ended up finding DMT, a spirit molecule by Rick Strassman. Nice. And I read that and that just fascinated me. And he mentioned, and it got me really interested in psychedelic research. And he mentioned uh, the Multidisciplinary Disciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies in his book. So I went on their website and just tried to see what kind of psychedelic research was going on throughout the country. So I typed in DMT, nothing popped up. LSD, nothing popped up. Psilocybin, nothing popped up. And then finally I typed in MDMA and it popped up and it said for PTSD. And my eyes just opened really wide. And then I saw that it was in Boulder, Colorado. And it was almost like divine intervention, it seemed like. And that's how I ended up getting involved. Wow. That's awesome. That's funny. <clears throat> DMT spirit molecule is probably the first book I picked up too in Barnes and Nobles. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Would you mind getting into like a little bit of details on how that how the sessions went and like how how it like helps you with the PTSD? So yes. The the sessions were really nice. I mean, I would just end up laying down. So first thing in the study, I ended up having an interview with a principal investigator just to kind of determine that, you know, I qualified for the study. Uh, then we ended up scheduling like a physical. So they checked my blood pressure, blood, I think, you know, heart rate, all that other stuff, just make sure uh, I was physically qualified uh, to go in. And then I ended up having these 90 minute uh, therapy sessions with a male, female therapist team. And we, I think we had like three or four of those kind of just talking about, my life and what was affecting me, what I was kind of wanting to get out of the first MDMA study or session. And then I'd have the session and the very next day we'd have a 90 minute, 90 minute session to integrate everything that happened with MDMA, like two or three sessions after that to kind of keep integrating and then set up an intention for the next setting, the next session. Uh, But the sessions themselves were really relaxing, really nice. I would just lay down on this couch put this blindfold on, ingest the medicine, and just kind of verbalize my thoughts. And what was really interesting about these sessions was generally like with every other like therapy or treatment I've done, the the therapist would end up guiding the session. But with the MDMA, they let the the MDMA itself guide. And I'll give you a good example of it. Talked about how there's this wall around my heart. And, you know, after I got back from Afghanistan, I was emotionally numb. I don't really feel anything for anybody because when you're over in a war zone, when you're dealing with like these people that are just blown to hell or, you know, shot everywhere that are living, that aren't living, that are having their lives lives changed forever. 
you got to sever that connection between your heart and your head. Um, mm-hmm. Otherwise, things don't make sense. You know, you're not going to survive. There's no rationalizing any of it. So when I got back, I didn't know how to reestablish that connection. And there's this wall around my heart that prevented me from doing that. And when I was young, it was real small. I could easily go over and access my emotions. But after Afghanistan, it was like all these bricks were added. And it's just, I'm not sure if y'all watch Game of Thrones, but you know, mm-hmm. the wall, it was like that. It just extended out of my field of view. And I ended up developing this sense of like Stockholm syndrome with it. I was convinced it was there to protect me or help me when its intentions didn't have me in mind at all. Mm. And that's when the therapist started asking me questions. So I got to that point without them even being involved, really. And then they'd ask questions like, well, what's the wall made out of? Can you climb it? Can you break through it? Things like that. So it was more questions of curiosity rather than anything. Right. Mm -hmm. I know Michael and Annie are um, trained in... IFS, like internal family systems, were the uh, clinicians kind of, di- did they do any parts work with you? Uh, what do you mean parts work? Uh, internal family systems, like uh, you do a lot of like work on these different parts of yourself. So it's trying to integrate these these different parts. So I don't know, maybe your your clinicians weren't trained in that, but um, I know they, they kind of go over it a little bit in the MDMA uh, training and they uh, suggest that IFS is a, a good model to work with. So I don't know. It was just, just a random question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not really sure. Like I would bring up things like interactions with my family or my wife and stuff, and we'd explore that a bit. But again, when they 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 weren't pushing for me to talk about anything in specific, anything in particular. And maybe when I mentioned something of of in, of interest that they thought was uh, worth exploring, they would they would mention that and we'd explore it a bit. Cool. I can't think of anything specific yeah. in regards to that. And they had you stay overnight, right? Like per the protocol. Yeah. So I would end up taking it early in the morning, like nine or 10. And usually the effects of the MDMA would end at around five ish, give or take. And then after that, the night guard would come, he'd get me dinner and yeah, I just stay the night in the ther- therapy therapist office and then at like eight in the morning, the next day, we'd have a 90 minute session just to kind of talk what happened the day before. What I hear from a number of folks who have had like uh, transformational experiences with psychedelic therapy is that they it just it, it's unconscionable that the stuff is not available and accessible to everybody. There's even a this famous kind of kidnapping victim. What was her name? Kalia. She's kind of a, a pretty famous advocate now. I think she was kidnapped for uh, for a while or something. And yeah, now she, I think she headlined some like huge tech conference, like the biggest tech conference in the world and like the keynote. And so she had the opportunity to talk about psychedelic therapy there a few months ago, which is pretty cool. And yeah, whenever I read stories of people um, who have gone through it, they have similar feelings. I, I, I imagine you do like, do you, do you feel like we need yeah. more science first or do you feel like it's ready to go? I think, uh, I mean, I'm pretty, I always err on the side of freedom in general but uh yeah i think it's like criminal that we're really keeping this from people i mean like i'm a veteran you know a lot of like a lot of other people i talk to that have ptsd a lot of times ago yeah i had this like childhood trauma or whatever you know it's nothing it's nothing compared to what you went through but i don't get the whole comparison thing because it doesn't matter how you end up getting it it all affects us in similar Mm -hmm. ways so you know not only veterans veterans aren't the only ones suffering that need this people like like i just mentioned that experience childhood trauma law enforcement firefighters people that are victims of rape of gang violence you know this really has the potential to heal so many people and you know to speak for, for the vet, veteran community in a sense is I know so many people that uh, I deployed with and you know that I know that I've been deployed but I'm afraid I'm going to get a call tomorrow next week next month that they killed themselves and mm-hmm. to know that if they try and do the same treatment that I did outside of this map study that they risk being thrown in a cage for years on end is criminal to me like in and mm-hmm. of itself yeah it is <laughs> Yeah, watching all this drug war stuff, it's so crazy to me because I can just imagine these cops or DEA agents being super dickheads about ayahuasca or like anything, you know, people like they bust into a a home where people are doing a private MDMA therapy session off the books and both people go to jail. Unbelievable. And Um, I don't know how much I can blame like the individual like police officers in and of themselves. I had this uh, like a year ago. 
had this some car trouble out in the middle of nowhere and this police officer ended up, ended up giving me a ride uh, to the closest town, which was like an hour away. And I talked to him a lot about psychedelics and stuff. Cool. And he was just kind of blown away. He, uh, he's like, wow, I'll take, you seem like a smart guy. I'll take your word for it. But, um, you know, like all through all my training and all the stuff I've learned, it's always been negative. And, you know, the people that they have to end up encountering, in general, like if someone ends up like calling someone that's been crazy on acid or something, it's usually very negative, right. life threatening. So that's like their only the only time they've been exposed to it. So they have a lot of the, these negative emotions and feelings mm-hmm. toward drugs in general. Right. They're not finding me personally at, at a festival where I'm having the absolute time of my life <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and harming no one. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, and I also wondered too, like how often they would be able to talk to somebody to like even hear positive stories. Like I wonder if, you know, people are just even afraid to bring it up around them because it is an illegal topic. Like when would they be hearing about some of these positive therapeutic benefits? Um, Whenever I find out anybody's a cop, I right. shut down, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I didn't. I'm like, uh, where's the where's the nearest exit? <laughs> I love talking to cops about it because I know I'm on the right side of the issue, really. You know, usually every single cop I've talked to, I usually go out my way to try to talk to them about it. But uh, it's, the response has been fairly positive. I mean, when I was part of the psychedelic club, I talked to uh, one of the training officers over at the uh, CUPD about uh, giving the police officers training to end up like interacting with people that are having an intense psychedelic experience because the year before they had this CU student named Samuel Forgey who ended up taking some LSD and something happened and he ended up trying to kill his roommates that were in there. The cops ended up showing up, filling them full of lead, you know, killing them. And, uh, you know, it's preventable from both sides. So we tried to end up giving them the Zendo project training for the police officers because, you know, that, it's it's not just for people that are like having an intense psychedelic experience, people like on other drugs or that have other psychological problems and stuff. So I just think in general, law enforcement doesn't have the training to like, I mean, they're always supposed to like talk people down, but it's, they don't have the training, you know, with people that are suffering psychological problems or having an intense psychedelic experience. But she was really open to the idea and she thought it was something that they, that the, her officers needed. Unfortunately, it never materialized, mm. but she was extremely uh, open to the idea and saw the value in it. That's something, Kyle, and I might investigate. It sounds like a really <laughs> impactful way to reduce harm uh, in a lot of places. Yeah. And uh, one of my really good friends is a police officer with the CUPD. I go to church with them. And we ended up, uh, me, him, and a good friend of mine, Will Beaton, who started the uh, Psychedelic Club over in North Dakota, and, you know, Will, he, he talks a little bit like a hippie. He's a cool guy. He's talking about, like, the isness and how everything is and just these really general terms. My police officer friend, like, a month later, was just like, you know, I got this call for this guy that was on uh, LSD, took too much LSD, and he's kind of freaking out. And I just talked to him like Will talked to me, and it all turned out great. <laughs> so. I actually had a conversation um, with Will a few weeks ago. Um, I'm thinking about going up there to North Dakota to talk to the club up there. Um, oh, yeah, be really that'd be cool. great. They're doing some really amazing work out there. Yeah, he was uh, talking to me a lot about like Suboxone treatment centers. And well, first, I guess I, I was shocked at, at the culture difference between like how drugs are thought about in that culture versus down here in Colorado. And it was, you know, I didn't believe it. I was like, wait, what? They don't believe in Suboxone treatment? Like, you're not allowed to get a license to, as a doctor to treat people with the drugs you think they should be treated with that are legal? Like, that, that blew my mind. There's a bunch more, too, but they, they've got a lot of work ahead of them. But, yeah, they got, they got a really cool thing going up there. Um, yeah, they're making some great progress. I remember, like, a year ago, there was some – I mean, I might be butchering this a bit, but hopefully you'll get the essence of what I'm trying to say. The community out there – just the general public ended up creating this drug, this drug form where they ended up bringing a bunch of members of the community to talk about cannabis and like opiate epidemic and stuff. And all of the panelists had the same, were saying the same thing, essentially like just say no to drugs, which, you know, as we all know, hasn't really been effective. And a psychedelic club member asked a question to the panel and he was essentially laughed off the stage Mm-hmm. And after they started the psychedelic club and starting to be started to be more credible and education based, all that jazz. A year later, they ended up having another panel and they ended up bringing 
uh, a member of the psychedelic club to, to go do that because they realized kind of the error in their ways by only like talking about one viewpoint and through all the stuff that psychedelic club has been doing up in uh, North Dakota, they realized the value in that <clears throat> and how just say no isn't the most effective way to, to, to combat this problem. Mm-hmm. So they have been making some progress and it's been really impressive. Just say no though. And or K N O W. Yeah. That is a good one. I have appreciated so, like, that quite SSDP. A bit. Yeah. So the law enforcement thing is a big deal. And I, I do appreciate that perspective. I, I, I need to start talking to them <laughs> because when I, when I'm going around, I'm like, Oh shit, I'm doing this media. I think as a whole, they don't have the education or the culture to talk about this or know much about it. So I'm like immediately as bad as El Chapo or something. And I'm like, Fuck, right. am I going to take some bullets here? Am I going to jail for the rest of my... Actually, I wanted to raise a story. One of my buddies got busted for mushrooms up here. One, of, I think the DA or, or something like that had a really close family member die from quote unquote drugs. So they went on a mm. huge spree of arresting kids in between the age of like 25 and 27 in town, you know, with various stuff from, you know, obviously the people that probably should have been arrested were selling roof and all at bars behind the bar. That's bad news. Like that's probably not okay. And then other people, you know, just providing mushrooms to their friends, for instance. And, you know, he, it, it looked really bad, but I think the people went back to review like, okay, how bad in fact are mushrooms? So they did the research. They're like, Oh, <laughs> this is like a judge going, I guess mushrooms really aren't that bad. <laughs> they, they, and now people getting sentenced today with the article, like headlines on Google, like safest drug, like they might even get off even better, uh, which is pretty fascinating. So it, it's interesting that as fearful as some of us might be about law enforcement and the judicial system, like perhaps it's going to be okay, assuming we can keep talking to and educating these folks and, and coming right. out of the I mean, psychedelic closet. Have any- I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, coming out of the psychedelic closet, even to these pow- powerful people, might be what we need mm-hmm. to do most. Right. And as long as you don't have anything on you, you should yeah. be in the clear to go talk to law enforcement. <laughs> I, you know, I, I just don't know really how they operate. So I was like, fuck, are they going to search everything I own, then all my friends' houses? Like, how, how far are they going to go? But, you know, I, I, I think right. I watch too much TV. Yeah. And, you know, I'm very like uh privileged in the sense that you know i'm kind of growing up in a time where people are starting to realize that all these substances aren't as bad as we've been taught especially living living in colorado people are very open in general so i've never really you know had that fear of even mentioning it like losing my family losing my job going to jail things like that so uh you know, it's a lot easier for me to just say, yeah, just go talk to law enforcement or, you know, just come out of the psychedelic closet because I don't have that, all of that fear personally associated with it. Yeah. It's funny. And then over here, like I read all these like news reports of people just getting pulled over for like some stupid traffic violation and getting busted for having like a little bit of weed on them. And, you know, in New Jersey, it's still a misdemeanor. It's like, oh my God, this place is still just like in the stone age. (laughs) Well, not really. I mean, a lot of uh, states are, but yeah, it's just like, I still have that fear, like going, living in Burlington where it was decriminalized and they just didn't really care. It was like, okay, yeah. Like, a lot more free. And then down here, it's like, you know, they just have nothing to do. And it's like, okay, great. Like we can right. just keep busting people. It's like, Oh God. Yeah. It doesn't make much sense. And you know, I'm, I'm still going to maintain, and this includes other States that have legalized it recreationally, but the best high is a Colorado high because you know, like you can just sit down, smoke a joint and enjoy it rather than be like, Oh my gosh, are those, is that a cop? Is that a cop? You know, like, being crazy paranoid and stuff you can actually enjoy it in states where it's illegal not to mention red rocks like almost encouraging it at times i think uh i think they had a symphony event where it was like specifically come watch the symphony and get high uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I think i Good recall that last strategy. spring or the spring before <laughs> pretty hilarious yeah absolutely and have you heard of this retreat we're putting on in jamaica with legal mushrooms i've seen a few posts about it on facebook yeah, apparently, so apparently it's psilocybin's legal. legal over there, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's like Brazil and Jamaica is it, I think. Oh, Netherlands, but that's only truffles. It's pretty fascinating, mm-hmm. just because they haven't had to make laws because it's just a cultural taboo. It's like associated with witchcraft in their culture, so they're just like, yeah, whatever. Um, nobody's going to eat these things anyway. 
in the <laughs> in the mushrooms they're trying to sell to tourists are just like super garbage, like ditch mushrooms that you'd find on the side of the road or something. As a result, it opened up this whole opportunity to have like high, highly refined cultivated mushrooms. And mm. yeah, so we're, we're super psyched. We'll report back and hopefully we can uh, figure out a way to maybe get you down there eventually, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be great. <laughs> I know uh, there's this Marine veteran, uh, Ryan LeCompte. Mm -hmm. He runs this organization called Veteran Transiogenic Therapy, where he does something kind of similar. Uh, it takes veterans that you know have PTSD and brings them down to Peru to participate in these ayahuasca ceremonies just because they can't get the healing they need in the state. So it seems like kind of a similar thing. Yeah, yeah He was teaming up with uh, Soul Quest down in Florida for a little bit, but then I think that place ran into legal troubles. They're open now again, so I don't know what's going on with that. But yeah, I've been wanting to connect with Ryan for a, a while. I met him a while ago at some conference, and then um, I wasn't too sure if he was still – if that – that was still like operating and he was still doing that. Oh, they still are. As far cool. as I know, I've been seeing, seeing, uh, uh, seeing updates and stuff on Facebook about it. Cool. Uh, actually, Paul, Paul Austin just had him on uh, third wave the other day. I haven't oh, listened cool. to the interview yet, but I saw Ryan's face for the first time. I actually hadn't seen a picture of Ryan before. <laughs> yeah. I was like, Whoa, <laughs> I've heard about you for years, but I never considered you have a face. And do you have any, uh, uh, obviously you're in Boulder. So you've probably heard about the DMTX stuff. Have you, do you yes. have any opinions this research? I, I think uh, pretty much out of every single uh, proposal for psychedelic research I've ever heard, DMTX, the extended state DMT, is the most fascinating and interesting to me. Uh, just to me, like the idea, I mean, the way I'm thinking about it is, you know, with DMT, you're, you're going seemingly going to like these different dimensions, right, encountering these aliens or entities that have this intelligence or consciousness that that seems very distinct from yourself it doesn't seem like you at all so you know if you can be in a state for an extended period of time and interact with these things develop relationships well, relationships with them explore the space then and, you know you do that with enough people and record those experiences you can essentially like map out human consciousness which is just that has a lot of implications in general you can go to a lot of different places with it um, yeah. I'd be interested in working on the actual experimental protocol with them just because, you know, like I was saying before, psychedelic experience is extremely subjective. If you're trying to do some research here, you know, it needs to be like as science based as it can. So I'd love to try to get involved with them more. And I've talked to Daniel McQueen about it, and he seems open to the idea about uh, just kind of reviewing it and trying to make it as credible and professional and objective as it can be yeah, and we're, we're partnering with him a little bit so if you need a little bit of a push on daniel let us know <laughs> okay you living in yeah. boulder i think you have the reputation enough to get in there and carla just i think carla clements the pi lives in boulder it shouldn't be too carla hard. actually did uh some uh my interviews for the when i was in the mdma study oh, cool. yeah she's a great woman yeah she's like uh i think an expert in um What's the, the word coming to mind is profiling, but uh, evaluation of incoming patients or participants. I don't know the right clinical word, but something along those lines. <laughs> uh, evaluation sounds about right. Yeah. Cool. So, James, we're at uh, over an hour flown by. Anything you want to throw out? Any any links you might want to point people to? Or nothing really. The only thing that's like kind of popping out to me is that if anyone is interested in learning more about scientific research that's actually been published. Maps on their website has this amazing bibliography where you can search like all psychedelic research that's ever been done. I mean, including like things in like the 50s and 60s, sporadically some things in like the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, so that's a great resource to have because there's some really interesting papers in there with like how LSD influences what genes are differentially expressed. Uh, and neurons with the uh, LSD administration and some really like weird outdated studies like, uh, you know, giving LSD to ants or using LSD uh, as a treatment for body dysmorphia or homosexuality and uh, stuff like that. So it's uh, really interesting to read nonetheless. Well, yeah, thanks for joining us. I'll, I'll wrap recording now and uh, let's debrief. Perfect. Thank you for having me. Real quick commercial interruption for you. So this episode is brought to you by TransZen, a product by Enthezen. Caitlin Thompson, who 
developed the product is in our community and developed it for us by, <laughs> by us. And it is a great product. I have found tremendous benefit from it and really have uh, actually started to use it every single day now and uh, plan to do so for a while. And it's great for kind of mood stabilization and for party recovery uh, just because we're not really getting all the vitamins, minerals, and aminos that we need in our daily diet, regardless of how well you eat. It's incredibly complicated to eat well enough to get this stuff in your diet. So check it out. There's even an offer for free shipping from their site, entheozen.com slash PT for psychedelics today. You get free shipping and check it out. Thanks for supporting the show and back to it. Kyle and I decided to raise some funds using Patreon, which is a really cool way to support the show because you can choose to donate a small portion of money monthly for certain prizes. We are allowing you guys access to interviews before they will uh, ever hit the web. So for instance, um, this Horizons episode, they've had that for a few days and um, I believe there's some panel discussion stuff we've recorded and, and made that available there. So you will probably also have access to some member or patron-only webinars. We also have rewards including t-shirts, stickers, mugs, uh, access to our Navigating Psychedelics class, and much more. So check it out, patreon.com slash psychedelics today, or you can get a link from our site, psychedelicstoday.com. If you want to look really cool in some Psychedelics Today gear, you really want to check out psychedelicstodayshop.com. We've got all sorts of cool stuff from t-shirts to mugs to shower curtains and pillows. So you check it out. Any small purchase helps, even if it's just some stickers. We've got some cool stickers there. Check it out, psychedelicstodayshop.com. Tell your friends. Maybe buy some presents for this uh, upcoming, what do you guys call it, Black Friday? Yeah, Black Friday. Maybe that. Or maybe it's a Christmas present or whatever. We would love you guys to check out some of our stuff there and support the show. Thanks. Thanks again for listening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Psychedelics Today signing off. We want to thank one more time Bluebird Botanicals, a great CBD company out of Colorado. And using Colorado-grown hemp, they make really great CBD products. So check them out. Kyle and I have been using them for a while. And uh, they're pretty awesome. There's a lot of reasons to use them, and uh, I know there's some controversy with the FDA not approving them yet, but you know, in states where you can't get uh, cannabis-based products, you can get Bluebird Botanical CBD, and there's no psychoactive effects, and there's plenty of CBD science out there worth checking out. So hope you enjoyed the show, and can't wait to bring you another episode soon. Bye.